Good afternoon, my friends. Uh, my name is Ming. I'm the Jolly Good Fellow of Google. And I also manage Google University's uh, School for Personal Growth, where we try to develop Googlers as full human beings on all levels, physical, mental, emotional, and beyond the self. And I'm very proud to work in a company which has both an author's series and a school of personal growth. It's pretty amazing. It's in the context of personal growth work that I got to meet our guest today, uh, Norman Fisher. I met Norman when we started talking about, uh, started a conversation about creating a course on emotional intelligence, which we named Search Inside Yourself. And we are open for registration right now for those of you who are still not on the course. And Norman impressed me the moment I met him. I felt that he was very dignified. He was very wise and deep. And after knowing him for a while, I discovered that he also had a soft side. And he, beyond being wise and deep, he's also very warm, friendly, very compassionate, and sometimes he even has a sense of humor. <laughs> sometimes. I consider Norman to be both a friend and a teacher, and I'm deeply honored to know him. And a few things from Norman's bio. Uh, Norman is a poet, a Zen priest, and an ab abbot. And he is one of the most senior Zen teachers of, uh, in America today. He was the abbot of the San Francisco Zen Center and the founder and teacher of the Everyday Zen Foundation. He was also the abbot of a fashion company called Zosa in San Francisco. Norman works regularly with business people, lawyers, Jewish meditators, or oh, mediators, yeah, same thing. <laughs> Conflict resolution specialist, and others to share the spirit and practice of Zen beyond the, his former trappings. He has taught at Harvard, Yale, Brown, and Stanford universities, and he just told me over lunch that he hasn't done a, a honest day's work in his life. And my friends, please welcome Norman Fisher. Thank you, man. Thank you very Thank much. You. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. I'm here to uh, talk about uh, a book of mine called Sailing Home, Using the Wisdom of Homer's Odyssey to Navigate Life's Perils and Pitfalls. Yeah, oh yeah, here, here, here's what it looks like. It's a, a little picture of a, of a boat on a stormy sea, which could stand for, for us. Anyway, uh, so uh, every time I, I've been talking about the book a lot, so I always try to think of something different to say so I don't get uh, tired of it. And what I want to say today is... Um, that uh, I want to refer to a talk that I saw on YouTube a little while ago by Daniel Dennett, one of the TED Talks. Maybe you've seen this talk. Daniel Dennett is a philosopher and uh, a favorite philosopher in the tech world because he writes a lot about uh, artificial intelligence and, and issues that are really related to contemporary technological uh, thought. And I think he is lately noteworthy for writing a book. Uh, there's been a few books defending atheism, sort of anti-religion books, and I think Daniel Dennett wrote one of them. And when he was at TED, he was kind of referring to this book. Anyway, he started his talk by, uh, with a slide uh, of a Guernsey cow. And he said, uh, who designed this cow? And, and, and the answer was, uh, well, natural selection designed it, and we designed it. And then he showed a slide of a sort of aboriginal cow, sort of the original cow, which was looked quite different from the Guernsey cow. And he said, this cow was designed by natural selection. Human beings had no part in it. It, it arose naturally from the forces of nature. And then human beings began to improve on this cow producing a Guernsey cow. So then he said, now why am I telling you about this cow? What does that have to do with anything? And he said, it's, religion is like that. He said, uh, human beings have been naturally selected to be religious. Every single culture anywhere in the world 
has some version of religion. So it's not uh, an accident that hu human beings seem to need to have some reference to the transcendent, some reference to the unknown, some reference to the mystery. And it's a natural thing for us. And, and not only that, but probably the people for whom that impulse was mandatory were the, the humans who survived and who became us. So we have this in us genetically. And then we're redesigning our religions just the same way we, we are redesigning the cow. And, we, and, and when you, you know, I've been involved in religious practice for a long time and studied religion, and it's real obvious that there is no such thing as an eternal religion. Religions are constantly in a state of change and evolution, uh, constantly uh, tra the tradition that they'll tell you We've been doing it this way forever. What they really mean is we just started doing it this way 20 years ago and nobody, nobody now can remember that it's 20 years old. In other words, religions are always changing, always developing. And, uh, but maybe now we better get better at that. In other words, when the way that religions have been changing and developing has not necessarily been that intelligent. You know, it, they, they haven't been intelligently designed, perhaps. They've been designed maybe willy-nilly according to people's faith. But maybe now we need to get better at, at and more self-conscious in a good way about re redesigning our religions so that they really help us. Because that's what I think religions are for, to serve our human need by giving us uh, a relation to something that's beyond ourselves that we seem to need because... We all know that we're born, and we all know that we're going to die. We're the only creatures on the planet that know that. So we're the only creatures on the planet that have an idea, a concept of death. And therefore, we're the only creatures on the planet that worry about having a meaningful life. We're the only creatures that can have a meaningless life. Cows can't have meaningless lives, but we can. So therefore, it matters to us that our lives have meaning. So we need to look at our religions and think to ourselves, uh, why have we been serving them instead of them serving us? And that's what they're for, is to serve us, to bring us some measure of happiness and meaning. Uh, and all too often, they've, they've not done that. So maybe we need to think more about what is religion really for, what, it, what is it really there for, and how can we, each one of us, in our own uniqueness, how can we access it? So this is something I think that's beginning to happen now in, in our time. I think we're at, at a kind of a cusp at this moment uh, between uh, a religious period of time that we've had for many thousands of years that's sort of coming to an end, and there's a lot of tension, a lot of focus, and a lot of force around that ending. But the new beginning of a post-religious time in which there's religion in a post-religious time in which religion is seen uh, more self-consciously, uh, more designed for us rather than putting us, diminishing us, uh, we're not quite there yet. And, and I think that's what I've been thinking about for a long time, is how can we practice religion uh, in a way that opens us rather than shuts us down, that gives us more than it takes away, so that we can learn how to live together on an increasingly small planet. So another thing I was thinking about lately uh, is, uh, you know, it's the, it's the time, the, hol the, the holy time of the year in the Jewish calendar, and I was looking at the liturgy for the Jewish high holidays, looking at the English translation. And uh, it's rather extraordinary, you know, the things that people say when they go to synagogue. And I thought, but you know what? People don't really believe these things anymore. People don't really have these feelings. You know, the, the, the text described, the liturgy describes feelings of you know, awesomeness and, and fear and trembling and you know, immense gratitude and all these things that you, you know, and you're thinking, who feels this? You know? And I think most of us don't. So I think that what's happened in the last 100 years, even though the liturgy hasn't changed and our understanding of it hasn't changed, we've changed quite a lot. And I think that what psychology has given us over the last uh, 150 years is much greater understanding of ourselves and our interactions within ourselves and between each other. So that we're a lot wiser and smarter and more astute about what is a human being and what are the, what are the real motivations that are operating in human beings and how do human beings relate to each other. 
But the result of that is that the, the human feeling that we've had for generations that's been in relation to something big and transcendent that's also in us, that, that scope of our human feelings, we've almost lost track of it. And we've localized our human feelings. So all of our human feelings now are in relation to myself, how I feel about other people in my life, how I feel, feel about my local politics. In other words, all the meaning in my life now has come down to that. So that we're in a situation where even if I get all the things that I want and need in, that, in those realms, I, I have a wonderful relationship, I have a good job, I have a secure home, but I'm still not satisfied because I have no reference to what's beyond those things. And, and actually, all the feelings that I have locally have their analogs in this bigger space, but we've lost track of the bigger space. It's there in the liturgy, but we can't get it out of the liturgy because we've lost our way to those larger, more expansive human feelings that source ultimately in the transcendent. So how do we find our way back? Because we need to, we need to know that our human feeling has that scope and that dimension for our own happiness, for our own sense of meaning you know, in this lifetime. So that's where you know, the whole realm of spiritual practice, spiritual endeavor comes into it. Uh, in my case, uh, meditation practice is the practice that I've done, silent sitting, uh, but there are many other forms of spiritual practice. But the, just the idea that I'm on a spiritual path, that the things that happen in my life that look like they're local and individual in particular actually have dimensions and reverberations beyond the local and the particular. We need that sense of, of our lives. And, and that's sort of, these are the thoughts anyway that are behind uh, this book, uh, Sailing Home, Using the Wisdom of Homer's Odyssey. So how did I kind of get to this particular subject? Well, um, you know, I do a lot of Zen meditation retreats. And part of, the, part of the format of the retreats is that there's a talk that I give every day in the retreat to encourage people in their silent meditation, give them some sense of uh, direction or context for the meditation. And I, you know, I talk about whatever is to hand, usually Zen texts or Buddhist teachings. But one year I happened to be reading the Odyssey and uh, in my talks I threw in some examples and some incidents from the Odyssey to kind of illustrate the points that I was making uh, about uh, meditation practice and about Buddhism and about how we live our lives. And, and, and I got a great feedback, great feedback on this. People really loved the stories from the Odyssey, partly because they're colorful, wonderful stories and you know, we all know them and sort of forget we know them, so when, when we hear them there's a kind of feeling of recognition. But actually, there was more to it than that. And here was what I found out. One of the problems, you know, with all religions, and, and you know, religions are great. Every, every religion is great. Every religion, to me, is like an ongoing conversation that's been going on usually for a couple of thousand years between a bunch of people who are usually pretty smart, very committed, share a language, share a perspective, and share a set of practices and rituals. And they're having this conversation about the meaning of our lives in a very beautiful and very deep and organized way. And of course, one of the problems is if you're not part of that conversation, it's hard to find your way into it. And maybe it's too costly to get into that conversation, so many people are shut out of it. But it is a beautiful conversation. But one of the problems with that conversation is that inevitably, religions are, are um, Kind of their central narrative is the narrative of a founder who is more or less a perfect human being. And if you're an adherent to that religion, you're kind of basically emulating a perfect human being. You're, trying, you're striving for that kind of human perfection. And guess what? You're not achieving it. You know, very few people will say, yeah, I've got this down. I'm pretty much exactly like Jesus. You don't hear that, you know. I've got this down. I am pretty much exactly behave the way Buddha would behave. Very few people, you know, say this. 
because there's a built-in problem. You know, th then what happens is, then we're all feeling kind of badly, like, what's wrong with me? I must have original sin. I guess I'm not like Jesus. Or what's wrong with me? I'm very, I'm very ignorant and I'm, my mind is very clouded. I'm not like the Buddha. So then this reinforces a kind of pre-existing sense of ourselves as unworthy or incapable and so on and so forth. So even though we admire the Buddha, we admire Jesus uh, and we want to emulate them, we often end up feeling badly about ourselves or not seeing our own beauty as a result of our following their example. So this became clear to me when I was presenting examples from the Odyssey as if the story of Odysseus were the story of the spiritual journey. Because Odysseus is a highly imperfect character. He's, he lies a lot. He uh, very seldom can tell a straight story without exaggerating or changing the details. He often falls asleep at the wheel exactly at the wrong time. He gives in to his passions on all sorts of levels. And as I was telling the story about what happens to him and, and his spiritual journey, as I was interpreting the Odyssey, people were saying, yeah, that sounds more like me than Buddha. <laughs> that sounds more like me than Jesus. That's the kind of spiritual journey that I am actually on, not the spiritual journey of these great masters or of these great adepts or these great saints. I admire them, but to tell you the truth, I don't so much see myself in them. So I said, that makes sense, you know, of course. We, we're not perfect people. So what is, it really, what really, is it really like, the spiritual journey for people like us who are not perfect? And how can we uh, uh, find a mirror for what actually happens in a spiritual life through, the, through Homer's Odyssey? And so I began actually getting into this more and more. And I, I have a seminar that meets once a week. and I. Usually it's on Zen or Buddhist texts, and I decided to do it on the Odyssey. I, we spent six or eight weeks reading the Odyssey, and I gave a, a Zen talk on the Odyssey every week. And, and, and as we contemplated it more and more, it made more and more sense. And so the book came out of all that. So this is a reading of Homer's Odyssey as if this text were, in fact, a map, a story, a myth, a metaphor for the spiritual journey, as if this were telling us you know, what actually happens. Not what, it's a, not what ideally happens in the Bible or in the Buddhist sutras, but what actually happens in real life with real people when they attempt to kind of seize their lives as spiritual journeys. And what happens is there's a lot of mistakes and a lot of problems and a lot of despair and a lot of two steps forward, three steps back. But if you read the Odyssey, that's what has to happen. That's how Odysseus gets home. And that's the whole journey, simply to come home. And that's a beautiful metaphor, isn't it, to think of the spiritual life as a journey home. We're just trying to come home to you know, our lives, to where we really belong. And so much of the time, we live our lives with a sense that we're not where we belong, not yet there. So how do we get home? And what does it take? And that's what the book is about. And, uh, and you know, this question of metaphor is very important because uh, the book has a, an epigraph, a quotation from uh, George Lakoff, uh, from his book, Metaphors We Live By, in which he says, metaphor is actually a sense, like seeing or hearing or tasting. That there are things that go on in our human life that cannot be apprehended by the eyes, by the ears, by the sense of touch, and even by thinking. There are aspects of our lives that are very important, maybe, maybe even the most crucial aspects of our lives that can only be accessed darkly and imperfectly through metaphor. And maybe that's why metaphor is so crucial to us, why literature is so important, why the arts are so important, because they're accessing aspects of our lives uh, that ordinarily are not available to us. And we need to have access to those parts of our lives. And, and after all, that's what religion does too. It provides us with a set, set of narratives and metaphors, however imperfectly, for grappling with not what somebody did a long time ago or what someone tells us is an ideal life, but with what our lives are now. 
and we desperately need to understand, you know, what our lives are at their depth. And lack of that really causes us to become sick, to become unhappy, uh, to become addicted to, we all know about addicted, being addicted to substances, but what about being addicted to, I don't know, email, news, distraction of all sorts. I mean, I think pretty much all of us are addicted to some form of distraction to fill up the space that would be taken up with the depth of our living if only we knew how to get there. And most of us don't. So uh, I wanted to be sure to leave uh, time for interaction. So I'm just going to read a little part of the book. I'll read the beginning of the book just to give you a flavor of what it's like. I think I've told you enough to get a sense of what, what's going on in the book. But here's just to give you a feeling for the style and flavor of the writing. I'll read, you, I'll, read, I'll read to you from the beginning, from the introduction. Whenever I go to a Zen meditation retreat, sooner or later, by the third or fourth day, if, if not the first or second, I get the classic feeling of deja vu. Haven't I lived this moment before? I'm sitting on my meditation cushion in my Buddhist robes, delivering a formal Zen discourse. I'm looking out at my silent, dignified listeners and thinking to myself, haven't I given this talk before? to exactly these people sitting in exactly the seats that they're in now, maybe many, many times. And I think, you know, what day is this? What year is this? What century are we in, after all? Strangely timeless, this deja vu moment seems very real to me though it is utterly different from the normal pressured moments of busy clock time that mark the purposeful hours and days of my ordinary life. I've been a Zen Buddhist student, priest, or teacher for my whole adult life. So I've done countless Zen retreats. So I guess it's not a surprise that I have the feeling that I've been here before. So I've been here before many, many times. And getting older, too, might be part of it. I've been going along in this body for many decades through many subtle changes of aging, getting up, sitting down, eating meals, going to the toilet, walking, standing, laughing, crying, wondering about the nature of sensation, being in time, writing books and poems, spring, summer, fall, winter, year after year, people dying, new people being born, the daily news always different and always the same. Perhaps the deja vu experience becomes more normal the longer you live. Maybe deja vu is just the ordinary actual feeling of being in time. Being in time, which is an astonishing experience. Although we're all so used to it, we, we hardly notice. Another thing about the deja vu experience, it doesn't seem to be coming from somewhere out of the blue. It feels as if it's actually been here the whole time, as if lurking in the background of my living, but only rising into consciousness now and then. And most of the time, I don't notice it because just like you, I'm too busy. I'm so mesmerized and absorbed by the convincing details and dramas of my life that there's no room for it. And it seems to take something radical, like a Zen retreat, or a whack on the head, or a sudden shock of some sort, like you know, powerful bad news or good news, to bring this moment forth into my awareness. And maybe I became a Zen Buddhist priest in the first place so that I could go to a lot of Zen retreats where I'd be bound to bump into this uncanny, rare moment, which is strangely, at the same time, so utterly normal 
and so utterly every day. And maybe I would be experiencing it all the time if I weren't so busy with other things. So this is a kind of strange predicament, isn't it? And I think it's the human predicament. And, and so at my talks and these retreats, I, I talk about this a lot, and, and I share this with my fellow meditators who are like me, gloriously, luminously, constantly stuck in the deja vu moment, but have failed to notice it, and therefore are missing out on maybe the most fundamental beauty of our lives. And so they're like me. They feel also an effort, to, they also the need to make an effort to return home to this present moment, even though they actually never left it. So this is the mystery and the pain, the mystery and the pain of our lives. Every one of us is exactly where we need to be, but we don't know it, and we're looking for somewhere else to be. The spiritual odyssey, life's deepest and most significant undertaking, involves a great effort, and inevitably it leads us on through many disasters and troubles in the checkered course of our living and growing. And where do we end up? Back where we started from, back to ourselves. Only maybe now with more wisdom. There's an old Zen saying, before I began to practice Zen, mountains were mountains and rivers were rivers. When I took up the practice of Zen and got involved in it seriously, I discovered that mountains were not mountains and rivers were not rivers. Uh, but now, after long years of training, I see that mountains are mountains and rivers are rivers. So the spiritual journey, the spiritual odyssey is full of deja vu experiences. It's full of irony, full of depth, full of strangeness, full of wonder and humor because it's so full of paradox. Because everything changes, absolutely everything changes when you embrace your life as a spiritual journey and at the same time, nothing at all changes. And I hear people say this all the time, after doing all this spiritual work, I'm a completely and utterly different person and nothing at all has changed. I'm just as I was when I was a child. And you know what? We're all on this journey. This is the thing. If you're born, if you die, if you have some sense of meaning or lack of meaning in your living, you're on this journey, whether you like it or not. Whether you insist on denying it, whether you insist on ignoring it, whether you insist on forgetting it, whether you insist on working against it, it doesn't matter. All of that is part of the process. There's a story in the, in the Jewish tradition, and I've discovered this exactly the same story in the Muslim tradition with different furniture, and it goes like this. There's a poor tailor from the village, and he has a dream that there's a treasure buried underneath a bridge leading to a castle. And he packs up his bags, and he journeys to the capital city looking for that bridge. And there it is. He sees the exact bridge he saw in his dream. But there's a big, mean-looking soldier guarding the bridge, so he doesn't know what to do. He sort of stands there staring at the bridge. He doesn't know what to do. And the soldier finally notices him and comes up to him and, comes up to him and asks him, you know, what are you doing here? And the tailor, being an innocent fellow, tells him the whole story. And the soldier bursts out laughing. He says, what a foolish person. You will believe the fantasies of sleep. I'll tell you the difference between you and me. I also had a dream. I dreamt that under the stove of a Jewish tailor in the village was buried a treasure. You come all this way at such cost of money and trouble following a dream, I, on the other hand, understand a dream is a dream, and I don't waste my time on such things. 
So the tailor promptly turned around, went home, took a shovel, dug underneath his stove, found the treasure, and lived out the rest of his days a prosperous man. So this is a story of all of us. You know, we're all born with some sort of dream or another. A dream that leads us forth uh, into our lives, into our unknown lives, in search of our heart's desire, whatever it is, and we usually don't know. And maybe we're practical, down-to-earth people, like this big soldier. And we think, well, that's foolish. Let's ignore the dream. Let's live in what we call the real world, which is actually a world that we've manufactured, paying no attention to the vastness of our lives, the uncanny, weird mysteries that are pre probably presenting themselves at every moment, only we're too busy and too prejudiced and preoccupied to notice. And so our lives go. Or maybe we are actually better dreamers than that. And we do follow the dream. But we fail to see its true import. And so we are inevitably disappointed when it doesn't pan out as we had expected. So we dust ourselves off and we follow the next dream that comes along. And then the next one and the next one. And we're always dissatisfied, always seeking something that we never seem to find. Or maybe not. Maybe we're like the tailor in the story. We do follow our dream. We have that much courage and that much vision. But we pay close attention to what happens in the process so that we recognize, and it usually takes a little help from a big, mean soldier, that what we're seeking is actually right there under our stoves. Only we never noticed it. And now we're ready to see it. So we go home, we take up a shovel, and we dig a little. So to me, this is uh, spiritual practice. Going home and digging a little. And what's, what's your shovel? You know, what, what works for you? What do you use? Uh, in, in my case, uh, the practice is very simple. Zen meditation is actually the, the, the absolutely the most simple and simple-minded spiritual practice possible. You sit down. You uh, open your body and your mind and your heart. You're sort of sitting there and resting. You breathe in. You breathe out. You gather the attention to the feeling of the body sitting and to the feeling of the breathing. And you try to keep your attention there, right at, literally at home, in the human body. And whatever else arises and passes away, you take note of it, but instead of pursuing it and identifying with it and making something out of it, you just see it come and you see it go. You're present with it, appreciating it, but not chasing it, uh, not identifying with it. And, and through that simple practice, uh, we can come to a tremendous uh, sense of appreciation of what it means to be alive uh, in this moment. And there are many other, many, many other ways of uh, doing this. Uh, and, I, and, I, and I actually have done a lot of interreligious dialogue and practice and, and appreciate you know, other religious traditions and other non-religious traditions. There are many other ways outside of religion that have been developed now to, through awareness of our own physical presence, awareness of what's actually inside of us, now, not what should be inside of us, but what's actually there, building on awareness of our body, awareness of our presence, awareness of what's actually in us, reaching forward and beyond that to see how we're connected in a, in a bigger way uh, to the cosmos and to one another in a profound way. It's that practice, that regular practice of prayer or meditation or yoga or whatever it might be that connects us, that's the digging. Digging, digging, digging to find the treasure that is right there at this moment as I'm speaking to you in your life. But we have forgotten how to dig, I'm afraid. And we've, and we've you know, made our religions into sort of abstract, moralistic, 
overlays so that even if we practice them half the time, we don't come home. And all too often, we're not inspired to practice them because we understand somehow, even without examining the question, that they're not going to bring us home. They can bring us home. All our great religions can bring us home, but we've got to find the path home for, first. So, uh, actually, uh, I really appreciate being here at Google because uh, really, I've been coming a lot to do the meditation course, and some of your faces are familiar to me from the course. And it's a wonderful spirit here. And, and, and I really love Meng. And Meng and I are very good buddies because uh, Meng figured out that uh, emotional intelligence, which is this concept that we have now, that we've begun, begun to understand, that, that we can become emotionally intelligent more or less, and that it, there's a cultivation there that's possible. And, and Meng figured out that the best way to help to develop emotional intelligence is simply through quiet sitting, through meditation practice. And so that's what the course, the Google course, SIY, Search Inside Yourself, is meditation based using this simple meditation practice that I just described as a way of um, coming to see and have some uh, purchase and understanding and capacity to regulate our, our emotions. And that's about 70% of the story. And the other 30% is that through our emotions and through our connection to one another that we can make by deepening our understanding of our emotions, we can reach beyond that to sense of transcendence and ultimate meaning that we absolutely need, especially now, you know, especially when we face great difficulties when we're going to have to revise our values and our sense of what we're doing. We're going to have to realize that we're, we're really just a few of us here together on the planet. How can we not get along? How can we not cooperate? How can we not love one another? How can we not see that we're in this absolutely together and that whether we live on the other side of the world and practice a radically different religion and, and culture or whether we're here living as we do, we share the same understanding and the same humanness. When we understand that together, each one of our lives is going to be way bigger than it is now. And whatever human problems we have locally are not going to be so difficult for us uh, seen in that light. So anyway, that's what I... I, re I realize now, you know, I, I, I never really was that interested in religion, you know, actually. <laughs> I, I, and I got into the religion just because of starting to sit in silence. And before I knew it, you know, I was wearing robes. I don't know what happened. Um, but, um, but it looks like uh, I've been thinking about this question of how can we find a way to practice religion that really serves each one of us and all of us together in a new way for a new time. And, and that's really what the argument of this book is, using Homer's Odyssey to make that point, I hope with some humor and interest. So anyway, I want to leave the rest of the time, about maybe 15 minutes or so, yeah, for uh, questions and dialogue and interaction. And I want to encourage you to speak up, because I want to hear from you. I probably spoke more than I intended already. So please. And there's a mic there, yeah. If you use the mic, it'll be good for the video conferencing. Yeah. First questioner always is the most courageous one, so it's most difficult. Huh? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I studied classics in college for a lot of the reasons that I guess drew you to the Odyssey specifically. Um, I just see the Greek religion and the Greek mythology very much as a blueprint for life. Um, in a lot of ways, it's very human and it appeals to me, it speaks to me because of that more so than any other religion ever has. 
And I was just wondering if you were looking to expand your efforts outward at all, or are you content with the Odyssey and that's that? Oh, you mean reading other Greek classics in the, in the same light? Greek. Or other things. Or yeah. otherwise, but yeah. yes. Yeah, uh, well, I did, uh, I did a book on the Psalms, uh, and I, you know, the, the, Psalm, the Hebrew Psalms, uh, where I did the same thing. I, I actually did a translation of the Psalms in my own way with this, all these things that I'm talking about in mind. Uh, but no, I, I, you know, most of the things that I've done uh, have been rather willy-nilly, you know, uh, and so whatever kind of hits me over the head as something that needs to be done ends up to being what I do. So, uh, no, I haven't thought of uh, doing other Greek classics, but, but it is true that, uh, like you say, reading the, reading the Greek classics does give you a certain expanded sense of what's possible uh, in life, yeah, different view on life. Thanks, yeah. Anybody else? Anybody who doesn't want to go to the mic and wants to shout a question that I'll repeat? <laughs> well, I guess not. So I want to thank Meng and all of you for coming. And uh, I guess we have copies of the books that you can look at and buy if you want to. Yes? Yeah. And uh, whether you look at the book or not, or uh, the important thing is uh, think about this. If it's true that you, as a human being, uh, inescapably are on a spiritual journey and have a spiritual life, and that unless you take up that spiritual life in one way or another, you're going to regret it, because at some point you'll need it. Maybe not now, maybe not next year, but sometime. If, if that's true, if you think about that and you, you realize that that's true, and that's my argument, then you need to ask yourself the next question, which is, what am I doing about it? You know, what, how am I living my life, and what am I doing about that necessary human function? And if the answer is not too much, uh, maybe you have to think again. And, and you know, I don't, I don't say that everybody has to change their lives tomorrow and become religious or something like that. But it's something to think about. You know, maybe it's not for now. Maybe it's not for this moment of your life. Maybe it's for later. But sometime, probably, you need to address this question. And, uh, and I hope that when you do, you have the resources, the friends, the possibilities there for you uh, to find a way uh, back home. So thanks a lot for coming. And maybe I'll meet some of you uh, in our course sometime. Thanks, Ming, again. <laughs>